the Pope of Rome. They say that he is the Holy Father for almost one billion people, and certainly he is respected and admired by many tens of millions more, including, regrettably, almost every so-called Protestant Christian leader in the world. Islamic imams adore him, and so do Buddhist priests and Jewish rabbis, because he, he is so close to them in his beliefs, as we're going to see in this documentary. Throngs follow him wherever he goes. Hundreds of thousands gather wherever he preaches. He's been in America many times now. We have Pope John Paul II now, but there is coming another pope. I believe this pope, the first Polish pope, has set the foundation for an amazing resurgence of Catholicism throughout the world. We're going to look at Catholicism, at the Pope of Rome, but most of all, we're going to look at the collapse, yes, the collapse of the Protestant movement. Martin Luther is dead, say Chuck Colson and Robert Schuller and Jerry Falwell and so many others according to their actions, according to their statements. Many of them are now proclaiming that Pope John Paul II is the world's greatest spiritual leader, the moral voice for our time. Jack Van Impey, uh, one of these so-called ex-Protestants, even says the Pope is the last day's prophet for us. We're going to be looking at these men. We're going to be seeing that there is no such thing other than a tiny minority of people. There is no such thing as the Protestant movement anymore. It is gone. It is vanished. Oh, I believe there is an elect of God. There is a small group of people who still believe in the things of the Lord, who are adhering to the Word of God, the Holy Bible, which the Catholic Church says we must add tradition to. There's only a few left. Maybe you're one of them. But we're going to see the great apostasy. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Bible tells us there will be a great falling away in the end times. Is that today? I believe it is. Now, we're going to see then that whereas the ex-Protestants, that's what I call them, the ex-Protestants are falling down nearly. In fact, I, I, I've been seeing some Protestants visiting the Vatican, actually bowing down, getting on their knees, and kissing the very ring of the Pope of Rome. They are bowing down to the Pope. They are hand in hand with him. They're following him instead of the Lamb, wherever he may go. The question is, my friends, where is the Pope taking these great tele-evangelists, these great evangelical Christian leaders, from Baptist to Pentecostal to Assembly of God to Lutheran to Brethren, they're all moving into the realm of the Pope's dungeons. Where are these people really going? I say dungeons, and I'm talking about spiritual dungeons, the very pit or the abyss of hell. Let's look at some of these ex-Protestants, I call them. The first is Paul Crouch. Paul and Jan Crouch founded uh, Trinity Broadcasting Network. Here is a picture of Paul Crouch visiting Rome in the Vatican. Here he is shaking hands with the Pope. Oh, what a great occasion Paul Crouch said it was. He calls the Pope a great Christian leader. Here we have Benny Hinn holding up his hands, but listen, <laughs> he's also been at the Vatican. He visited the Pope and coming back to Trinity Broadcasting Network, he told Paul Crouch, this is Benny Hinn, he said that the day that he met Pope John Paul II was the, quote, greatest day of my life. You would think that the day he came to know Jesus, if he was truly a Christian, would be the greatest day of a faith healer or a televangelist life. But Benny Hinn said it was the day that he met Pope John Paul II. Here's some of the other ex-Protestant leaders that are now hand in hand with this Pope, Robert Schuller. Robert Schuller says that 
even before he had the construction to begin on his crystal cathedral in Garden Grove, California, that he took the blueprints, the architect's plan. He flew to Rome and he had a personal audience with the Pope and had the Pope to bless them. On the seventh floor, yes, the seventh floor of the Crystal Cathedral, there is now a picture of Robert Schuller with the Pope, with the Pope blessing these plans in what I can only call as some kind of a cult dark ritual. At the same time, Robert Schuller has literally erected a statue of Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, one of the best known Catholic leaders in North America. He's gone on now to be wherever he's going to be. He's died. But Bishop Fulton J. Sheen was a 33rd degree Mason, and he has a statue built to him, an idol, at the Crystal Cathedral. There's Chuck Colson. His wife is a Catholic. Chuck Colson has written a book called The Body, in which Colson says we all need to come together, just as Robert Schiller actually turned to the a uh, Los Angeles uh, uh, Catholic cardinal who was visiting one of his worship services and said, your eminence, we need to go to the Holy Father, we Protestants, and ask him, what can we do to come back home? Chuck Colson says, as a body, we all need to come together. And, you know, Martin Luther, that was for another time. Now we need to come together under the eminence and the prominence and the leadership of this one man, the Pope. Pat Robertson here he is of the 700 Club and of Christian Broadcasting Network. Pat Robertson, also a high-level Freemason. Did you know that he got his start when he left law school? He could not finish his law degree. He couldn't pass it. <laughs> and no problem. J. Peter Grace, head of the North American Division of the Catholic Secret Order known as the Knights of Malta, set Pat Robertson up down in Brazil and South America. Yes, he worked hand in glove with J. Peter Grace. Even today, the 700 Club works with AmeriCares and other groups that are affiliated with the Knights of Malta, the secret order of the Vatican. James Dobson, a focus on the family, has had many Catholics as guests on his national radio program, his popular radio program. James Dobson was given an honorary doctorate and he said he was so proud to receive it from a Catholic university in Steubenville, Ohio. Pro-Catholic. Again and again we see all of these former Protestants, Jack Van Impey, Billy Graham and others gravitating, bowing down to the Catholic Church and to its Pope. And I'm telling you, even though this pope is frail and aging, the next pope will be, will be younger and more vigorous, and they will bow down to him too. And he could well be the Antichrist. Here's some pictures of Billy Graham. I don't want to show you because these are shocking indeed. These are from the book Smoke Screens by my good friend Jack Chick. Here's a picture of Billy Graham right before one of his crusades visiting with the Oakland, California bishop, a Jesuit priest. Notice this news item. It says, the Pope is almost an evangelist. Who do you think said that? Billy Graham did. In an exclusive interview, Billy Graham hailed Pope John Paul II's pilgrimage to Poland as a triumph for Christianity. Wow. The Pope is almost an evangelist. So we see all of these incredible events. Now, we're going to look at Billy Graham here. Some people still, I remember speaking up in Winnipeg, Canada at a conference, and a man got so angry at me when I talked about Billy Graham cooperating with the Catholic Church. He literally began to scream and holler at me and call me right with a big group of people around. He said, Tex Mars, you're a liar. The Pope is totally different from Billy Graham. Billy Graham would never, never, never have anything to do with Roman Catholicism. Billy Graham is a great man of God. He would expose the great sins of the Catholic Church through the centuries. Quit lying about Billy Graham. Well, friends, we're going to see who's lying about Billy Graham. I've already shown you these pictures. I've already shown you the news clipping showing that Billy Graham says the Pope is, is, is how great he is. Now we're going to see what he said with Larry King and Mr. Frost. Here is Billy Graham himself 
talking about what he thinks about Catholicism and how close he is with the Catholic Church. Are you comfortable with the Vatican? Oh, I'm very comfortable with the Vatican. I've been to see the Pope several times. And in fact, the night that, I mean, the day that he was inaugurated or made Pope, I was preaching in his cathedral in Krakow. I was his guest. You were preaching in his church mm -hmm. the day he was made Pope. That is correct. In Krakow. Wow. <laughs> now, you must have been shocked. Well, of course I was. There was shouting on the streets, you know, the next day, uh, Polish Pope, Polish Pope. And I knew it wasn't Dashinsky. I'd just been with him in Warsaw where I'd received an honorary doctorate. And uh, from the uh, uh, school there. And uh, my next uh, stop was in uh, Krakow as the guest of uh, Wojtyla. There were just two cardinals in uh, Poland at that time. You like this pope? I like him very much. He's very conservative. And today we have almost 100% Catholic support in this country. That was not true even 20 years ago. And uh, the bishops and archbishops and the pope is our friend. And we have uh, plans underway now for a couple events that will probably be world news about our relationship with the Roman Catholic Church. And because uh, there's so much that we have in common and so much of what we believe. They believe in Christ. They believe in the death of Christ on the cross and his resurrection. I feel that I belong to all the churches. I'm equally at home in an Anglican or a Baptist church or a Brethren Assembly or a Roman Catholic church. But Billy Graham is not the only one who is in bed with the Pope and the Vatican. There's also Jack Van Impey. Some people say they can't believe. But Jack Van Impey is now beginning to literally quote the apparitions of Mary. He talks about our mother Mary and quotes her. And I'm not talking about the Mary of the Bible. I'm talking about the Mary that's visiting Medjugorje and Lourdes and Fatima, Portugal. These Mary apparitions, even though the Bible tells us to look to our living God and not to spirits. Here is Jack Van Impey. We're going to show you some amazing things. It's going to be a little lengthy here, this clip. Here he is on Trinity Broadcasting Network with his wife, Rexella. And listen to Jack Van Impey as he promotes Catholic priests, Catholic bishops, the Pope, as he propagandizes. That's right. He is a propagandizing pimp for the Catholic Church. That's all you can say about poor Jack Van Impey and his wife, Rexella. You will see where he will take the Catholic catechism and say, I believe in this book. I believe in this book. This book has the gospel in it. We're talking about the Catholic Catechism. You will see that. The Catholic Catechism, which is the, the holy book, it's the added traditions to our Bible. It's man's traditions, the Catholic traditions. You will see how he, he brags about Billy Graham and uh, you know going into the Pope's lair. And so here we have Jack Van Impey and his promotion for Pope John Paul II and the Catholic Church. I have attempted to read one book a day and have already covered 10,000 volumes in my lifetime. I used to use Haley's Pocket Handbook and the Two Babylons by Hislop to knock my brothers and sisters in other denominations. And then the Spirit of God started to do something in my heart about 10 years ago. And I'm a different man. And I, just in the last four weeks, have read 25 volumes on the Catholic Church, the Pope. And here are just a few of them, so you know what I'm talking about. So don't write and say, hey, uh, you don't know what you're talking about, and try to correct me, because I know everything there is to know about Christianity, Catholicism, Protestantism. I used to be an opponent and work against other brothers and sisters in Christ, but this book, the Catechism, really opened my eyes. I used to hear it said that Catholics were not allowed to read the Bible. In the Catechism, this new one, there are seven to 10,000 Bible verses that everything this Pope says, even his book, Crossing the Threshold of Hope, is backed by the Word of God. And I'm going to say some things that'll shock you today. 10 years ago, when I started my quest for unity, I lost all my support. The churches cut me off. I faced bankruptcy. 
but God brought us back. I'm willing to pay any price, any price, even if I had to go off the air again, to take the stand I'm going to take today on my love for my brothers and sisters in the Catholic and all the different Protestant churches. This Pope loves people. Styling Revelations, Pope John Paul II. Now, Pope John Paul II was not the first to speak about ecumenicalism and unity. Actually, Pope John XXIII was the first to speak about it. But as you well know, this Pope continues the theme so very, very much. In fact, we cannot remain separated. This is his cry. And from the Vatican magazine, that they may all be one. Now, inside of this magazine, he carries on the theme, this task I cannot carry out by myself. And he is saying this, of course, to his cardinals. And then another cover. For the sake of unity, in a dramatic gesture aimed at ending centuries of Christian division, Pope John Paul II offers to change the way papacy primacy functions. Can the papacy change a very big question. Rick Sella, he says, yes, I will even pass out authority to bishops, to others in the future if we can unite in Jesus and be one. I tell you, I want to weep. It's, it's so moving. Yes. And I want to ask for forgiveness too. 1976, I was invited to Scotland to be the evangelist for the World Congress of Fundamentalists. It was headed up by Ian Paisley as far as the European segment was concerned. And this is the man who often leads the Protestants to the front and they kill one another. A minister of the gospel. When I was there, I was to preach a sermon on dangerous evangelism and knock Billy Graham because he would often unite with Catholics. I couldn't get it across my heart to do it. I was dividing the Christians. I ask for your forgiveness. Until I die, I'll proclaim nothing but love for all my brothers and sisters in Christ, my Catholic brothers and sisters, Protestant brothers and sisters, Christian Reformers, Lutherans, I don't care what label you are. And you know, Jack, there are so many other Protestant ministers who are doing the same yes. thing as you, yes. like Bill Bright of Campus Crusade Chuck and Olson, Chuck Colson. Southern from, Baptists. Southern Baptists yeah. are trying to unite the body of Christ, those who really know and love the Lord. And now, Chuck Oman, our announcer, is coming once again to tell you about our offer of the week. And you know, Chuck... This was quite a heart-moving program, wasn't it? Rexella, I was deeply moved as Pope John Paul II opened his humble heart of love to all of us. Billy Graham calls him the moral voice of the 20th century, and I agree. This was a great program, thank you. And we'll continue on this theme next week, the things on which Catholics and Protestants agree. Pope John Paul II says there's much more on which we agree than on what we disagree, and you're going to be shocked even the great Bible prophecy. So tune in. Jack, we have thousands of Catholics, Protestants, and people from all denominations and religious backgrounds watching us right now. And perhaps you as a Catholic or Protestant are saying, how do I really know that everything Jack says about the Catholic Church and what they believe about prophecy or eschatology, things to come, is really what they believe? Well, I'd like for you to see some of the books, just some of the books that he has been reading recently to back up everything that he is telling us they believe. Here is one. I read 25 Catholic volumes in the last 12 weeks, and as you'll see, this is entitled The Reign of Antichrist, The Thunder of Justice, The Great Sacrilege, The Call of the Ages, The Raptured, Peter, Lovest Thou Me, The Three Days Darkness, and Catholic Prophecy. Now I want to tell you folks, they are right on. I've spent years studying the Word of God. I've got 70,000 hours invested in this book. I've read a book a day for many decades now and have over 10,000 volumes that I've studied. And I want to tell you folks that we often misrepresent our Catholic brothers and sisters what they teach. And now that I know the truth, I will stand for what is right and teach what is right according to their beliefs. And oh, you Catholic people, listen to your leaders and priests and cardinals and popes. <laughs> <laughs> and agree another, with me. Right, another cardinal. That it's here, folks. Thank God for these great Catholic leaders. 
cardinals, popes, who say it's near. Be ready. So actually, you know, Jack, they based all of their anticipation on the coming of the Lord on the Bible. Yes, we agree on all these things. It's, it's exciting to have read all these Catholic books. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was stirred. <laughs> Billy Graham and Pope John Paul II. They are no strangers to you, Dr. Graham, the evangelist, and of course, Pope John Paul II, the head of the Catholic Church worldwide, Jack. I know these men have meant quite a bit to you. Oh, they really have, Rexella. I read everything that Dr. Billy Graham puts out and Pope John Paul too, because these men have given me real direction in my life concerning the message of salvation and concerning the message of love and forgiveness. And you're going to hear some things about forgiveness in a few moments that'll shock you as to what the Catholic Church under this Pope is about to do. But I can't say enough about these two great giants of the faith because of what they've preached and how they've stood true. And you know, I get so upset with people when they try to make me change my mind. I read all of Pope's messages. I know what he believes. And someone said to me the other day, do you really believe he's a Christian? Come on. If Jack Van Impe wasn't enough, here is Hal Lindsey and Paul Crouch, founder of TBN. It appears that Hal Lindsey wants to put out a video warning that you know, the Antichrist may come and he could even be the Pope. And Paul Kraft doesn't like that. He says, well, surely you're not talking about the current Pope. Isn't he a wonderful Christian man? And Hal Lindsey agrees. Oh, yes, this Pope is a wonderful Christian man. Here is Hal Lindsey, the author of The Late Great Planet Earth, one of the top so-called prophecy teachers on Trinity Broadcasting Network, and Paul Crouch, the network's founder, as they promote the Pope as a great Christian leader. I bring the Pope in because he is the friend of both of them. Mm -hmm. And he kind of... But, you know, after the Antichrist is raised from the dead, these two have the best uh, credentials of anybody in the world. And the reason he wanted them there was to testify that they literally saw him raised from the dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so th that becomes, you know, the, the false prophet becomes the great proclaimer of the miraculous uh, qualities of the Antichrist. Isn't, isn't this scenario of bringing the Pope into it, isn't that going to cause our Catholic friends a little heartburn? No. Well, I, I don't think so because uh, <laughs> I brought in the prophecies of Fatima, oh. which predicts that the, the second Pope after this Pope will be uh, somehow involved with the Antichrist. You know what? That's right. I read that. You read it, didn't you? Those well, I, children so, in Portugal that saw exactly the... Exactly, the children of Fatima. Yeah. They made this prophecy which has been kept in the Vatican. And every pope has known about them. And I don't think any pope was ever as troubled by them as the present pope. I mean, no. uh, he, he is troubled. He said, I know that... He said, I greatly fear that a future pope will either be the Antichrist or he will be wrapped up with it. So I'm not saying something as a Protestant trying to hit at the Catholic Church. This is something the Catholic Church itself has already said. Has seen. Yeah, the, yeah. But the present Pope has seen. It. Because the present Pope, John Paul II, he's a good man. He, he's a man of faith. I, yeah. We covered him at Denver, Colorado a couple very, of years ago. It would be very was. difficult to say that he's not. Now, I know a lot of Protestants out there will get their dander up and so forth but look uh folks a person is a, a person is not a christian because of the system he has to be a part of a person is a believer in jesus if if he comes to a personal faith in jesus christ he is born again and he is truly a christian well, how even though they may be wrapped up in some things that don't fit. Well, you know there's probably things in the Catholic Church that Pope John Paul doesn't even agree probably with. Probably so. You know, I'm sure of it. Certainly Mal uh, Malachi Martin has yeah. uh, brought this out and by this blood, you know, it's a, listen, quite a book. I heard John Paul stand in Denver, Colorado, what, mm -hmm. two years or three years ago when yeah. he came to that great youth conference? Yes. Now the charismatic movement has gone, as we used to say in East Texas, whole hog into the Pope's lair. In 1977, in 1986, and in 1987, there were huge meetings of charismatics, Assembly of God, Pentecostals, Church of God in Christ, and others. They met in New Orleans at the Superdome. Thousands of them thronged in there. 
I'm going to show you just a little bit of what went on there at the stadium, uh, at the, uh, the New Orleans Superdome. And it all led up to a great speech by Catholic priest Tom Forrest, who led them all in rousing yells and said, we're all a team. We are all as one. Here is the New Orleans meeting of thousands of charismatics from around the world, many of them pastors, lay leaders, televangelists, as well as you will see Catholic priest Tom Forrest. He's in the Vatican. He's an American priest. He's been given control, you might say. He's been put in charge of the Catholic tongues movement, speaking in tongues, and thus there he was being honored by all of these charismatics. Watch this. I hope that you will stand and respectfully welcome uh, Father Tom Forrest. Redemptorist priest Father Tom Forrest inspires us to be part of the team and carry this message of Jesus' love to our generation. To convert this pagan world, we have to be more than workers of signs and wonders. In our holiness, we must be the sign. We must be the wonder. Now, I said we couldn't do it alone. That's what this meeting's all about. Are we a team? Yeah. Let's show them that we're a team. Again. Amen. team right now. Let him just bring us together. Let him cleanse our hearts. Let that spirit of holiness come down upon us. Hallelujah. Let the fire of God burn on this place. Let the Lord melt away the sin. Let God be exalted. Let his people be set free tonight. Let the holiness of God descend upon the people of God. Now the question is, if all of these ex-Protestants, almost every name, Christian celebrity that you can mention, if all of them say the Pope is a great Christian leader, he teaches the gospel the same as we do. We believe in the, in the, even in the Catholic catechism. If that's true, if they believe in the Catholic doctrines, should we not look into these Catholic doctrines? What does the Catholic Church teach? Well, in my newsletter some uh, years ago, I talked about exactly that subject. What do the Catholics believe? And I had a list of things that the Catholics practice and believe in. Look at them. First of all, Christians pray to Mary, or they can pray to any of thousands of dead saints. They believe in the Catholic Church that Mary in heaven is the mother of God and our mother they say. They say she's appearing today to faithful Christians who pray to her instead of Jesus and say her rosary, which begins, Hail Mary, full of grace. The next thing that the Catholics believe is that through infant baptism, babies are regenerated, that is, saved. But of course, they're only saved for a little while because you have to keep doing good works to ensure your salvation. The Catholics believe the Bible is not sufficient in itself as the final authority for Christians, that church tradition and the official papal teachings are to be accepted. After all, the Pope, when he speaks in ex cathedra, meaning on matters of religion and faith, the Pope is perfect, infallible. Why, he's as perfect as God is, they claim. Notice that they believe that you can give an offering or a donation to Catholic priests so that masses can be conducted for the dead. You can get your aunt or uncle or brother or sister or mother or father 
out of the suffering fires of purgatory by having a mass for them. And it goes on and on with the strange teachings that salvation is not available through grace alone. Then there are those Christians, so-called Catholics, who can gain special favor with God by scourging, ravaging, and torturing their bloodied bodies with metal-tipped whips and by other painful self-flagellation, self-inflicted beatings. Then there are the statues, idols, and images of Mary, Joseph, and thousands of saints, dead saints, that are bowed down to, venerated, honored, and worshipped. Did you know that one of the Catholic versions of the Bible, one of the most popular versions, the Douay Rims version, uh, version, for years, many of its editions took out the second commandment to the Ten Commandments. They just obliterated it. It was just missing. Why? Why would they take out the second commandment and pretend it didn't exist? in the Bible, because the second commandment, a commandment tells us, do not worship graven images, in other words, idols, images, and they worship them. They decided that shouldn't be in the Bible, so they just cut it out. Now, so I can be fair, friends, I want to go to the source itself. You may say, oh, I can't believe Catholics believe in those things. I have here, my friends, and I've studied it thoroughly. The Catechism of the Catholic Church. This catechism is almost 800 pages. All of the bishops and the cardinals got together and received the blessing and the approval of the Pope himself. This is the book that Jack Van Impey says is as good as the gospel. I mean, this book has the gospel in it. And this book can be believed in. And people like Jack Van Impey and others are saying, this is the book you must believe in, in addition to the Holy Bible. Well, let's just see. We're going to look at some areas in here. First area I begin is page 222 and 223. Listen to this. The Jewish faith, the Jewish faith is already a response to God's revelation in the Old, Test uh, Old Covenant. The Jewish faith, if you're of the Jewish faith, you have already responded to God's revelations. You don't need then to believe in Jesus. You're okay as you are if you're a Jew. Then, also on page 223, it talks about the church, the Christian church's relationship with the Muslims. It says, quote, the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator in the first place, amongst whom are the Muslims. Wow. These, that is the Muslims, says the Catechism, profess to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us, that is as Christians, they adore the one merciful God. The, the Muslims worship the same one God as do the Christians. They don't need Jesus. They've got Muhammad and Allah. Friends, let me tell you something. The Quran, which is the holy book of the Muslims, flat out says that Allah, their God, had no son. Friends, our Bible, the Christian Bible, says clearly, if you don't believe in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, you do not have the Father. If you don't have the Father, you don't have the Son. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus told the Jews, if you don't believe that I'm God, if you don't believe that I'm He, you will die in your sins. That's what Jesus said. Paul said, no other foundation can a man lay than Jesus Christ. But here we have the Catholic Catechism saying that Jews and Muslims do not need to believe in Jesus for salvation. They have the same God. They have a God who has no son. And the Jews in their holy book, the Talmud, it actually says that Jesus Christ was a bastard, an illegitimate son. And that Mary, they claim, was a whore who had sex with a Roman centurion. And 
the Jews don't need Jesus? Can I ask you a question? Why did Jesus die on the cross if the Jews don't need Jesus? If the Muslims don't need to know him? Did he die in vain? Well, according to this book, unbelievable. This is just one of the many areas we could talk about. Uh, and by the way, you say, oh, so it's okay then for the Muslims and the Jews. They're already saved, whether they know it or not, I assume. But page 224 goes even further. It says, those who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, these too may achieve eternal salvation. Did you get that? Those who don't even know Jesus Christ, not part of the Christian church at all, these too may achieve eternal salvation. Wow. That's what I call a wide and broad road to destruction, friends. You see, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't even know what the Bible is, that's okay. You can still have the secret presence of God. You don't even know the name of Jesus, but you have the secret presence of God. Let me prove that to you. On page 227, it says, The missionary task implies a respectful dialogue with those who do not yet accept the gospel. Believers can profit from this dialogue by learning to appreciate better those elements of truth and grace which are found among peoples and which are, as it were, a secret presence of God. In other words, they're saying that in all of these religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and the others, they have elements of truth and grace. Do you believe that? I don't believe there's any truth in Hinduism. I don't believe there's any truth in Buddhism. Certainly there's no grace, which is the love of God in those false religions. But this catechism says that they have in those false religions, they don't call them false, they say a secret presence of God. So God is hiding there. The, ma the, the, the Hindus, my friends, worship over three million gods, including Kali, the great Cobra serpent goddess, the goddess of sex and carnal license. They worship her. I suppose that's the secret presence of God. When you're worshiping her through the sex act in those temples, the great snake goddess, Kali, you're worshiping with the secret presence of God. This is a sick, sick book. And it goes on, on and on. If you don't, protect the environment. That's a sin, this Bible says. And by the way, it says the Virgin Mary, this is page 251, the Virgin Mary is acknowledged and honored as being truly the mother of God. She is clearly the mother of the members of Christ. She's your mother and my mother. No, she's not. Well, that's what it says here, though. Okay? Mary, it calls her. Mary, mother of Christ, mother of the church. And listen to this. It says... The union of the mother with the son and the work of salvation is made manifest. Did you get that? The work of salvation is because of the union of the mother with the son. In other words, Jesus can't save you on his own, but the union of the mother and the son can lead to your salvation. And that's what Billy Graham believes in. It takes Mother Mary and Jesus to save you. No wonder all these people pray and worship Mary even more than they worship Jesus, it seems. It talks in, on page 319 about the new birth that you have at baptism. John 3, verse 3 says you must be born again. They said when you're baptized, you're born again. Friends, that's not true Christianity. We can go on and on this Catholic catechism. In page 516... Boy, this is the ultimate. It says the veneration of icons. That's idols now. That's graven images. Were introduced by the Son of God himself. It says the Son of God introduced a new economy of images. That's double talk. To say that you can worship images, graven images. And the Son of God himself introduced these. That's their claim. On page 517 of this New Catholic Catechism, 
they say the Christian veneration of images is not contrary to the first commandment. The first commandment says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. They say it's okay to worship images, to have statues of, of, of Joseph and Mary and to worship before them. Statues of St. Christopher, of St. Teresa, of St. Lucia, uh, on and on and on. You can bow down and worship before these statues. And that is not contrary, they say, to the worship of God. But, oh, it is, my friends. On page 566, here's something you'll be astounded about. This Catholic catechism teaches on page 566 that homosexuality is something you're born with. It says homosexual men and women do not choose their homosexual condition. They can't help it. They're born like that. Friends, this is not even good science. It goes on to say that these persons must be accepted, accepted with respect I don't respect the grave, grievous sin of homosexuality. No, I, w I refuse. But they say we're to respect the homosexual. Unbelievable, my friends. And then finally, we, this is, these are just a few things now. On pages 642 and 643, talks about that it is good to make supplication and praises to the mother of Jesus supplications, pray to her, ask her for things. This, my friends, is the new Catholic catechism. This is what Catholics are taught in their version of Sunday school, what to believe. Now, friends, I don't care what Jack Van Impey says. I don't care what Paul Crouch, Billy Graham. Here's a picture of Billy Graham receiving his honorary doctorate from Belmont, college, a Catholic school. When he was there, Billy Graham said, the gospel that they preach at this school is the same gospel I believe in. No, it's not the same gospel I believe in, and I have just proved it to you by reference to their own so-called traditions holy book that they add to the Bible. Add to! Does not the Bible say in the Revelation that if you add or subtract anything at all, God will bring upon you all of the plagues of the book of Revelation. Now, let's look at some of other things about the Catholic Church. I want you to understand. Here's a picture of the Pope. Isn't it interesting how he dresses up in this strange fish's hat that comes all the way from Dagon, the fish god worship way back in the time of the Philistines in the Old Testament? Isn't it interesting that he still shows Jesus still on the cross Still suffering, even though Jesus, my friends, is no longer on that cross. And take a look, my friends, at this strange symbol around the neck of the Pope. Made of gold. Is that not a dragon with fire coming out of its mouth? A golden dragon at the bottom? And is that not supposedly the Son of God coming out of the sun, the sun god? This is the worship of the sun god. This is the worship of the dragon. The book of Revelation calls Satan, that old serpent, the dragon. And the Pope has him around his very neck in this picture. One of the most shameful things about the Catholic Church, of course, has been the sexual fornication of their priest. Many of the priests and many of the nuns are lesbians and homosexuals. But even worse, they are that is the, the male priest, the homosexuals, are pedophiles. Did you know that many of the Catholics themselves are now admitting, I can show you books written by Catholic scholars that say over 50%, some say 80% of all priests in America, all Catholic priests, up to 80% are homosexuals. This is incredible. This particular uh, cardinal, Mr. Law of the Boston Diocese was forced to leave his post, forced to resign, was recalled to Rome after so many hundreds of children were molested by priests in his diocese and he covered it all up and they continue to cover it up to this day.
Here's an interesting article from down in Mexico. It talks about the police. On a certain day, they bring statues with them to work. It'll bring them good luck. It'll help them do their jobs better. Statues of saints. You don't believe they worship saints? Here they are carrying these statues around with them. But if you read this article closely, it says cops and robbers both turn to St. Jude. One of the policemen says, I have all sorts of friends who are criminals and they pray to St. Jude. The drug addicts say when they pray to him, they always have plenty of drugs. And the robbers say they rarely get caught. Isn't that amazing? The, the robbers, the crooks say that St. Jude helps them to be better criminals. Incredible. Here's a, a man named Dr. Peter Kreeft, I'd like to introduce you to. He's well thought of in Catholic circles. He's a professor, high-level professor at Boston University. That's, by the way, where Senator John Kerry uh, graduated from with his law degree. This is a Catholic Jesuit, the Order of the Jesuits, a secret order of the Catholic Church. That's what Boston University is. And Dr. Peter Kreeft, Dr. Peter Kreeft is one of the Professors of religion there. Now, Dr. Kreeft said some things recently in a book called Ecumenical Jihad. Ecumenical Jihad. I want you to know about. Let me give you some quotes. First of all, he says that Martin Luther, the founder of the Protestant movement, is a heretic. So we see right away what Peter Kreeft believes in. Second, he says, and listen to this, Confucius, Buddha, Muhammad are all in heaven. Muhammad is today on his knees in heaven worshiping Mary. Now can you just picture that sight in your mind? Muhammad on his knees worshiping Mary in heaven? Confucius, Buddha, Muhammad, they're all in heaven. Of course, Martin Luther, I guess he's in hell. He's a heretic. But, but all of these, these false gods and prophets are in heaven according to to Peter Croft. And there, they're worshiping Mary, like every good Catholic. Listen to what he says about Allah. Allah, writes Peter Croft, is not another God. We worship the same God. Why is Islam expanding so spectacularly, he asked? Because God blesses those who obey his laws. Friends, did you know that Jack Van Impey also said the same thing basically in a recent re uh, TV program that he suggested that Islam, the, the Quran, is the word of God. And finally, listen to what he says here. This is Dr. Peter Croft, one of their top theologians in the Catholic Church. It shows you what Catholics believe. He says, quote, Catholicism agrees with paganism more than with Protestantism. Friends, if you're a Catholic, you're closer to paganism and witchcraft than you are with Protestantism, evidently. Then he says, Catholicism is more like African religion. Catholics believe pagans are right and Protestants are wrong. Well, let's take a look. I have some pictures here of <laughs> African tribalism. You tell me whether you think that you prefer this African tribalism and this voodoo over Protestantism. And by the way, when we get to this last picture, it's a picture of two chickens with their heads cut off. Of course, in different religions, Santeria, voodoo, uh, even the Rastafarian religions in some segments of it, and certainly in African tribal religion, they believe in animal uh, sacrifice. And they will take the blood and do horrible things with it. Here's a little white girl, by the way. Boy, they're teaching them to do voodoo now. And then finally, here's this grotesque image of art with a voodoo doll. Now, if you don't believe that the Catholic Church is moving right into the field of the Eastern religions, in other words, as all the Protestants are being folded into Catholicism, the Catholic Pope has taken all of these people, Billy Graham, Kenneth Copeland, Oral Roberts, uh, Jack Van Impey, Chuck Colson. He's taken them by the hand 
And where is he leading them? He's leading them into the deviltry of the Eastern religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, and all the others, African tribal worship, witchcraft, voodoo. All of these things are being melded in, molded in to the Catholic Church and accepted. So when you accept the Pope of Rome and his uh, new catechism, you're accepting African tribal worship, the witch doctors, Native American Indian worship of the so-called great spirit. You're accepting these horrible, hideous apostate teachings as well. Don't think for a moment you're not. For example, did you know that this Pope has given credit to Mary himself for saving his life? Remember he was shot some years ago? He, he reached over to look at a picture of Mary that a kid was carrying. And at that moment, the bullet struck his body. And he said it missed his heart only by an inch or so because of Mary. He goes each year, Pope John Paul II, to Fatima, Portugal. And there he worships the images of Mary. Here, first of all, we see the Mary of the Roses. And look on Mary's head, this idol. She has a crown. She is queen of heaven. Now here from USA Today, August 12th, 2004. Look at this article. It says, Pope to grace city of miracles. Lourdes, France. They claim that Mother Mary once appeared there to children and that people who go there can see great miracles of healing in their bodies. And people go from all over the world to Lourdes, France to pray. Here we have Pope John Paul II. Look at this picture. This is the city of miracles, Lourdes, France. And it says in this caption here in this picture, the Pope has gone deep into a cave, deep in the bowels of the earth into a cave to worship this statue of Mary with all of those candles. Isn't that odd to the darkness of a cave? deep in the bowels of the earth to worship Mary. And he also goes each year to Fatima. Interestingly, there are some Catholics who worship Mary that say, you know, it's good for the Pope to come to Fatima, Portugal, to worship Mary every year in a special invocation. But now, they say, the Vatican and the cardinals and the bishops are approving for Hindus to come and have their worship service. They say this is desecration. In other words, it's okay to worship Mary, but the Hindus should not be joined with the Catholics in doing so. This is actually Catholic Family News newspaper. Here's the article I want you to see. It says, Report of Hindu Desecration at Fatima. There where they have the statue of Mary and the, the, the cathedral to, that they built to Mary, they're saying that Hindus have been invited by the Holy Father, uh, the assistance of the Holy Father. By the way, the Holy Father, they call him himself, uh, although the Bible says Jesus has called no man father. They don't care what the Bible says. They have their traditions. The Pope went over to uh, India and received the great mark of the god Shiva in his forehead from a Hindu priestess. Yes, that is true. And now we have the, the, the papal uh, officials inviting these Hindu gurus and others to come to, to Fatima, Portugal to, to do all of their rituals at the very cathedral that's been built to honor Mary. Look at some of these pictures. Here we have a picture and the caption says, A close-up of the Hindu priest as he desecrates the most holy altar at Fatima. These words, by the way, this caption actually comes from Father Nicholas Gruner and his organization. They are opposed to the Hindus. They're okay for worshiping Mary, but opposed to the Hindu worship. Notice the little mark on this man's forehead in the so-called third eye region and the statue of Mary with her crown behind him. In this next picture, we have the Hindu guru or priest and some of his so-called Hindu pilgrims at the sacred el, el, uh, altar there in the Catholic Church at Fatima. Can you imagine the Catholics allowing the Hindus to worship all of their Hindu gods and goddesses? Now in this picture we have the Hindu guru or priest investing the rector, that means the head, the head priest of the Fatima shrine 
Monsignor Luciano Guerra with a Hindu prayer shawl. Now this Hindu prayer shawl has verses from the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindu Bible written all over it. And here is this priest going to put it on over his black garb. Here again is a bishop, a Catholic bishop, Seraphim de Salsa Ferreira e Silva, the Bishop of Fatima. He willingly accepts the Hindu prayer shawl with all of the Hindu scriptures all over it. What a desecration indeed that is. Not too long ago I received a magazine called Modern Manna in the mail. I looked at it very carefully and it says that there's going to be a world Sabbath of religious reconciliation. I found that interesting. A world Sabbath of religious reconciliation? The world Sabbath. What a desecration of the Sabbath day. It says this will be held, and it was held back in January of 2000. It's the first interfaith holy day. Look at this symbol. There you have the great sun god of the Hindus. And of course, the Nazis adopted a version of this for their own. The great will of the sun god, Lucifer, the solar angel. And then on the other page, here they reprinted an article. The Press Enterprise, it says October 29, 1999. John Paul II over here, the headline says, summons world's religions to Vatican to solve common problems. And then this newspaper article says leaders of 20 faiths unite in denouncing extremism. If you're a fundamentalist who believed in the word of God, my friends, you are an extremist. And the Pope led leaders of 20 different religions all together in renouncing your faith. That's what went on at this great meeting. Here's the Pope as we see him with other world leaders at Assisi. He's met many times in these great global meetings. And they've had everything from snake handler priests from Togo uh, to witches to Native American Indian doctors to African tribal witch doctors and so forth, all coming together as one. Ex-Protestants, listen to me. The Vatican is rising. It's rising all right. And it's bringing you with it. And you have a rope around your neck. You're being hung with all the evil doctrines and teachings and practices of the Catholic Church because you have become one with the Pope and the Vatican. One of the things that I think is most dreadful is the Vatican's worship of Mary. But not the Mary of the Bible. That would be okay for us to at least acknowledge her, to love that Mary, as I'm sure Jesus loved her. I hope to see Mary someday in heaven. I really do. But I'm not going to bow down and worship her. She has become an idol. She has become a venerated icon. And now you have statues. They claim they cry. They sweat blood. Uh, some of them have known to, been known to talk to people. And they're worshipped by millions. Not too long ago, some friends of the ministry sent me this video. Messages from Heaven. It shows remarkable things about the universal worship of Mary. Did you know that many Protestants are now beginning to worship Mary? They're beginning to travel to all of these sites, Lourdes, Fatima, Medjugorje, or down in Mexico at Guadalupe. And they're all acknowledging Mary as the mother of God and the mother of Christianity. And incredible miracles, they say, are being given by Mary. And Mary has been telling people to pray to her and she will intercede. She calls herself the mediatrix, the mediator between man and God. Even though the Bible says there is only one mediator between man and God, and that is Christ Jesus himself. Look at some of these incredible images. See what's going on with the Catholic and the Protestant worship of Mary, and you know this is wrong. For a long time I have suffered for you. If I do not want my son to abandon you, 
I am forced to pray to him myself without ceasing. You pay no heed. However much you would do, you could never recompense the pain I have taken for you. Larry Lewis is one of a growing number of individuals who converted because he believes the apparitions are biblical. I was a Protestant minister for over 30 years in different areas of, uh, of ministry and uh, I was very content, happy, uh, thrilled about it actually and uh, then uh, pastoring in the United Methodist Church uh, in the middle of that of my pastorate uh, there we were kind of blindsided by the Blessed Mother. She kind of came out of nowhere and uh, really began to turn our whole lives around. I boldly assert that his suffering became my suffering because his heart was mine. There are many other problems. For instance, the apparition even commands her followers to venerate her statues. As mother, I want to tell you that I am here with you, represented by the statue you have here. Each of my statues is a sign of a presence of mine and reminds you of your heavenly mother. Therefore, it must be honored and put in places of greater veneration. You should look with love at every image of your Heavenly Mother. The apparition has also requested shrines be erected in her honor around the globe. Furthermore, on October 8, 2000, Pope John Paul with 1,500 bishops, the largest group to assemble since Vatican II, entrusted humanity and the third millennium to Our Lady of Fatima, an apparition who promises her triumph and global peace. Dear God, you have given us the mother of queen, as queen. Through her intercession, Grant us the grace of living eternity with she and her son. The question is, does the Pope, whether it's this Pope, John Paul II, or the next Pope to come, is there a grand strategy of the papacy in the Vatican? I believe there is a grand strategy. Not too long ago, in the Catholic World Report, there was this article the grand strategy of John Paul II. It was an interview of Edward Lutvak, the advisor to the U.S. State Department, and Mr. Lutvak just happens to be Jewish. But he says, and by the way, this is not being critical. He seemed to be very much for it. He says observers are attempting to interpret John Paul's mind, but he said if you look closely, you can see a carefully thought out grand strategy to bring about a Catholic renaissance, a rising of the Catholic Church. It is a grand strategy of Pope John Paul II. Even the world's leaders have been coming to Pope John Paul II for answers. Here's an interesting issue of Time Magazine. It says how Reagan, that is President Reagan, and the Pope conspired together to bring about a holy alliance to assist Poland in its solidarity movement to be freed from the communist. They are giving the Pope co-credit with President Reagan in bringing down the Iron Curtain. Amazing things. At the same time, this Pope is receiving political credit for all of his achievements for many years now, and through several popes, we have seen these popes move toward Islam and through Judaism to bring those into its fold too. They've already got most of the Protestant world. The Archbishop of Canterbury says we need to return to the fold of the pope. We've already looked at Robert Schuller, Billy Graham, Jack Van Impey, Hal Lindsey, and so many others that are cozying up to the pope in the Catholic Church. But now the pope says, I want more. I do have a grand strategy. I want to be the ruler of the world. And one of the ways he can do it is to bring Islam and the Jews into the fold of the Catholic Church. All evil, my friend, is going to combine together in the last days. Here's a picture from 30 Days, a Catholic magazine. 
some years ago. It shows Pope Paul the Sixth, Pope Paul the Sixth, a previous pope in Jerusalem, almost almost forty years ago now. And look at him. What he's doing there is quite interesting. He is kissing a stone. I'm not sure of where this was taken. We do know that the rock, the stone, at the Islamic mosque on top of the Temple Mount is the place where they claim that Muslim, that that uh, Muhammad, excuse me, I said Allah, but Muhammad, the prophet, ascended into heaven bodily. He never had to die, the Muslims claim. And they have a rock there, and people come in and kiss that rock. Is that what the Pope is doing? Kissing this rock? Did you know that every country, every country the Pope travels to, as soon as he's off the aircraft and down the ramp, he bows on his knees and kisses Mother Earth? John Denver, the, the famous singer who was a New Ager, made up a little song praising the Pope for this during World Youth Day when the Pope visited Denver, Colorado area. John Denver, in the song, praised the Pope, and the lyrics went something like, Isn't it wonderful to see the Holy Father bow down and kiss the breast and the nipples of the breast of our mother Mary? The breast and the nipples of the breast. Is that who or what the Pope is kissing when he kisses the ground? Our mother, her breast? Amazing. Here's some newspaper clippings for you. Here is Pope John Paul II meeting with the, the imam who is the leader, the Muslim leader of the nation of Iran. Here is an interesting article from the Philadelphia Metro newspaper. It says, the Pope enters a mosque where he seeks religious healing. He wants to heal the two religions, the great monotheistic religions of Islam and Christianity and bring them together. Here we have a picture from News from Israel magazine. They're big promoters of Israel. They're Judaizers within the uh, church. Look at the Pope. He looks so, so sanctimonious as he prays there at the great wailing wall of the temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem when the Pope visited there a few years ago. Oh, it looks so holy. He's all alone there. And as he's there, he takes his prayer need. He, he's written it on a piece of paper. And as the Jews do, he puts it in the crack in the wall. You know, every day they have a janitor come, take all those out, take them out and burn them. But uh, the Pope, as did Hillary Clinton, as did George W. Bush, as did President Bill Clinton, they all visited there. And to impress the Jews in the world, they took their little prayer request and stuck it in a crack in the wailing wall of the Jews. They say this is a wall still left from Herod's temple. Even though Jesus said there will not be one rock left on another, they, by tradition, the Jews say, oh, we have a wall that's still left. Here is the Pope. Now what they don't show you, and what this next picture does, is that he did it only for publicity. It was a photo opportunity. Look at this picture. There's the Pope now bowing down. That's that same wall, the same day. And look at all the photographers, the paparazzi taking pictures of the Pope. He does everything for propaganda effect. It's all a big PR gambit for the Pope of Rome, isn't it? You know, the Jews believe someday a Messiah will come. They've rejected Jesus. They call him a bastard. They call his mother a whore in their Jewish Talmud, their book of laws. But did you know that Jewish mystics are still expecting? Many Jewish rabbis believe their Messiah is going to come. This man, Rabbi Mendel Schneerson of the Bronx, New York, his followers believe he's going to come back from the dead and be the Messiah. I assure you he will not be back. But look at the headline here. This is a newspaper from, let's see the year, it's 1991. And it says, Jewish mystics expect Messiah in September of 1991. 
It didn't happen. It didn't happen. They don't know when Messiah is coming. They don't even know his name, which is Jesus. And because they don't know his name, they will receive a different person. Jesus told the Jews of his day, he said, someday one will come in his own name and you will receive him as the Christ. Jesus said, I come in the name of the Father and you receive me not, but someday one will come in his own name. Him you will receive. I believe someday it is very possible that a man who claims to be a Jew converted to Catholicism, yes, a Jew converted to Catholicism, will go to Jerusalem and declare himself the Messiah. I believe that. Now, everything is coming together, my friends. All of the Protestants, except for just a few, have now gone into the very lap of the Roman Catholic prelates and the Vatican and the Pope. And when the next Pope comes, will he not have even greater spiritual authority and power from demonic forces? Yes, he will. The time is short. We're seeing as all of the Protestants rush toward the Pope and, Pope, and even Paul Crouch said, I'm not a Protestant anymore. I'm not protesting anything. No, they don't protest anything anymore, do they? They do not protest these atrocities. They are all coming together as one under the authority of Lucifer. That time is short. I pray that you will stay, however, my friends, with this great book, The Word of God. This truly is what we need to turn to. We need to believe in the Word of God. We need to be closer to Jesus than we've ever been before. Even as the great apostasy that was prophesied in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, a great falling away from the truth, it's happening. It's right here now. The Protestant Reformation of Martin Luther and all of the great reformers has been undone by Colson and Crouch and Graham and all the others. But believe me, my friends, where there is a counterfeit, there is a real. This is the real. Believe in Jesus. You'll never regret it. This is Tex Mars. I'm so glad you were my special guest for this program today. I hope to see you again as we continue to look at the Word of God. Until then, my friends, may God, our Lord and Savior, richly bless you. Yeah.